Welcome to the first chapter of How to GraphQL. We're going to start with a basic introduction to give some perspective on this new technology. So what is GraphQL? GraphQL is a new API standard that provides a more efficient, powerful, and flexible alternative to REST. It was developed and open sourced by Facebook and is now maintained by a large community of companies and individuals from all over the world. At its core, GraphQL enables declarative data fetching where a client can specify exactly what data it needs from an API. Instead of multiple endpoints that return fixed data structures, a GraphQL server only exposes a single endpoint and responds with precisely the data that a client asked for. So how does it all work? Most applications today have the need to fetch data that's stored remotely in some database that's accessible over the internet. That's what servers are used for. Whenever a client needs some information that it wants to display to the user, it sends a request to the server. The server is programmed in a way that it can respond to the request by re retrieving the appropriate information from the database and then sends it back to the client. Before we dive deeper into the technical details in the next chapter, let's understand a bit of the historic context in which the concept of REST was developed. REST has been a popular way to expose data from a server. When the concept of REST APIs was developed, client applications were relatively simple and the development speed wasn't nearly where it is today. REST thus was a good fit for many applications. However, the API landscape has radically changed over the last couple of years. In particular, there are three factors that have been challenging the way how APIs are designed. Increased mobile usage, low power devices, and sloppy networks were the initial reasons why Facebook developed GraphQL. GraphQL minimizes the amount of data that needs to be transferred over the network and thus majorly improves applications operating under these conditions. The heterogeneous landscape of front-end frameworks and platforms that run client applications make it difficult to build, to, to build and maintain one API that would fit the requirements of all the different clients. With GraphQL, each client can access precisely the data it needs. Continuous deployment has become a standard for many companies. Rapid iterations and frequent product updates are indispensable. With REST APIs, the way how data is exposed by the server often needs to be modified to account for specific requirements and design changes on the client side. This hinders fast development practices and product iterations. Now that we've got a bit more perspective on the concept of REST, let's go and understand a bit more about the history of GraphQL and how it came to be. Facebook started using GraphQL already in 2012 in their native mobile apps. Interestingly though, GraphQL mostly has been picked up to be used in the context of web technologies and has gained only little traction in the native mobile space. The first time Facebook publicly spoke about GraphQL was at ReactJS Conf 2015. And shortly after, they announced their plans to open source it. Because Facebook always used to speak about GraphQL in the context of React, it took a while for non-React developers to understand that GraphQL was by no means a technology that was limited to usage with React. In fact, GraphQL is a technology that can be used everywhere where a client communicates with an API. It's interesting to note that other companies like Netflix or Coursera were working on comparable ideas to make API interactions more efficient. Coursera envisioned a similar technology to let a client specify its data requirements and Netflix even open sourced their solution called Falcor. After GraphQL was open sourced, Coursera completely canceled their own efforts and hopped on the GraphQL train. Today, GraphQL is used in production by lots of different companies such as GitHub, Twitter, Yelp, or Shopify, 
to name only a few. There are entire conferences dedicated to GraphQL, such as GraphQL Europe or the GraphQL Summit in San Francisco. There are more resources like the GraphQL radio podcast and GraphQL weekly newsletter that keep you up to date about everything that's happening in the GraphQL ecosystem. This was it already for the first chapter of How to GraphQL. In the next chapter, we're going to get a bit more technical and discuss why GraphQL is the better rest.